So most of the time we're choosing to be outdoors because of the experience of natural navigation. I honestly believe, you know, doubles, trebles, quadruples the intensity of that experience. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. Before I knew better, I used to carry cans of food into the backcountry um, like a doofus. Uh, obviously, I don't do that anymore. I use freeze-dried food, and I really only use peak refuel, uh, the best backpacking food, the best freeze-dried food in the world. And if you keep listening to the episode, I can show you how to save 20% off an order if you want some. Powder 7's team of ski experts makes buying skis pretty easy. They're actually known for helping customers find the right gear specifically for them. They even sell used skis, which is pretty cool. Plus, Powder 7 ships to just about anywhere in the world, and they have incredibly fast shipping in the U.S. Visit them online at powder7.com, or you can stop by their store in Golden, Colorado. If you're like me, you have some pain and inflammation from your adventure sport. Sometimes you don't sleep well, and You can even deal with stress and anxiety. Uh, We have a possible solution for you later on in the show. So keep listening if you deal with any of those issues. Hey, everybody. Hope you had a pretty good weekend. Uh, I definitely did. I did not want to get out of bed on Saturday morning very early. But my wife was like, let's get up and go do something. And honestly, you know how it is. You just get in a rut with work or with school or with responsibilities and you forget to have even a little bit of fun so I was like you know what let's let's go do something I don't have any plans so we just started driving around and uh, ended up in Colorado Springs and my wife was like well let's just let's just do the incline which is this really steep uh trail it's 2,000 feet a little over 2,000 feet of elevation gain in like 0.8 0.8 miles. It's a steep trail. It's, li- it's it's literally about a mile of stairs and it's tough. And my wife is six months pregnant and we did it. She did it, which is the most impressive. Uh, and it was awesome. We had a great time. It was just an awesome day that I didn't even think was going to happen because I was just planning on just working. Um, despite hearing all our guests advised all, all the time of, of not spending your whole life working. <laughs> it's just easy, easy to do. It's easy to just say, you know what, I'm going to work on schoolwork or on work, work, or just hang out all day and not, not get out there and have some fun. So if you did something interesting this weekend, or, uh, if you want to share something, just call and leave us a voicemail at 812 mail pod. Um, or you can send us an email at, uh, info at adventure sports com. But about today's, uh, interview, it's with Tristan Gooley. Uh, the first few minutes were a little, little bad connection. Um, the, the audio is a little muffled, but it clears up really quick and it's a great end review. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, but basically Tristan, uh, had a passion for discovered a passion about himself for navigating his way through the world, uh, using nature, using clues in nature. And it's really interesting stuff. And if you don't feel like it's practical to you, uh, st- listen to the episode cause we address that. Uh, but it's a it's an incredible way to look at the world around you, and it honestly makes every moment, every day, just a lot more exciting uh, to think about what is speaking to you about which direction you're heading, how to get through life. I mean, it, it's just a really cool interview. But anyway, uh, before we get to the episode as well, I just want to say, you know, any any time we bring a sponsor on the show, um, which we this month we do have a few. And, you know, those help pay for this show. They help pay for our time that we spend building and working on the show. So they're very important that we get sponsors and retain sponsors. So if you are in need of any of the products or services we talk about in in, in the ads, please uh, reach out and 
take advantage of, of the codes that we usually have that get you a discount because anytime we have a sponsor, it's because it's a company and people that we believe in and what they're doing. We just don't take anybody to be a sponsor. It has to be something that we, um, really believe in that we've tried ourselves, and that we want to, that we think is going to help you as the listener. So if you're in need of any of the services this month or, or, or any of the show, uh, the sponsors you're hearing, give them a shot because they are helping this show happen as well as our patrons. Anyone supporting the show is helping make it happen. So thank you for all that. And thank you for, su- for supporting our sponsors and for supporting the show and for listening to it. Feel free to share it. Feel free to tell your friends, but anyway, here's today's episode. Hope you enjoy and uh, have a great week. Welcome everyone to the show. Today we have avid outdoorsman, New York Times bestseller. He's a TED talker, uh, an adventurer, and a n- nature navigator, Tristan Gooley. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mason. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I, I always ask this, and I, I legitimately don't know where where are you coming from today. I'm uh, very near home. I work in a in a cabin um, in a, a part of England, southern England, called West Sussex. So we're only a couple of hours from London, but uh, it's it suits me because it's about as wild as you can get and be a couple of hours from London. Wow, that's that's fantastic. I, I'm sure it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's um, English countryside at its best around here. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of that part of the uk and uh you know we have new england here in the states and and they're kind of similar they're very very uh it's quaint it's it's lovely it's absolutely it's gorgeous it's it's comforting countryside yeah i am i've i don't know new england well but it's it's world famous for uh for the the fall obviously but uh i think one of the one of the nice things there is is you do the seasons just generally a bit more seriously than us we sort of get a a, a sort of a, there's a mildness to everything here we we get snow right. and we we get a bit of heat in the summer but uh but it, it's all it's all very english and well behaved generally <laughs> that's funny man so yeah you're you're you have a uh a really interesting expertise, and I, I might ask a lot of the same questions that you answer on a frequent basis. I'll try not to, but it, it's just so uh, out of the box for uh, anyone else, really. I know, and I, I've watched some videos and read some of your books, and it, it's an awesome skill and it's an art. Uh, you you navigate by nature. C- could you explain exactly what that is to someone that doesn't know? And uh, and then how you got into it? Yeah, na- natural navigation is um, it's very simple on one level. It's it's getting from A to B and understanding where you are without using any tools, no maps, no compass, no GPS, no smartphone. Um, uh, so that that part of it is very simple. But then it it's uh, and it starts as a really practical, basic skill. You find north using the North Star, or the sun is due south in the middle of the day. Uh, and then you quickly realize that absolutely everything in nature is is trying to make a map and a compass for you. It's just it's just having a little bit of patience uh, and learning to to really use the senses. Uh, and literally everything outdoors is is a map or a compass. I mean, I say this. I, I was quite sort of scared to say it in the early days because I thought, you know, I'll end up looking a fool. But now I have fun saying it. So I'll say it to you. You can you can think of anything you want outdoors, literally anything. And I'll try and make a map or a compass out of it. Wow, that's incredible. So anything. Yeah, absolutely anything. What's one of the hardest things that it's to, to make a map out of in nature? Well, it's um, the, 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 if I start at the other end, the easiest things, things are, but that are very, very fussy. So plants or animals um, that have, have a really distinct habitat, whenever you see them, they are whispering, you are in this, in this niche, if you like. So stinging nettles is one of my favorite first ones to tell people about because it's it's the opposite of what people think people think stinging nettles grow everywhere but they they appear to grow everywhere because they grow where we are human beings change the soil the way we live work farm etc changes the soil so you know you see a stinging nettle and in the modern mind would be well that's just a slightly irritating weed but to a natural navigator it's a clue it's a clue you're close to civilization so that's the easy end at the harder end of plants animals um anything in nature that can crop up in a lot of different situations because then you know it's still whispering to you but it's being a bit vague it's saying well you might be here or you might be there so then you have to add other clues and it becomes much more of a jigsaw at that point because nature has so many 
you know, so much going on. A forest is not just the trees. It's it's the soil. It's the animals. It's it's the rocks, the the moss, everything. So all that together gives you a very good idea of what direction you're heading. Yeah, it's 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 the map or the compass. So w- when people are totally new to the subject, the the fast way in is actually direction. So you, the the thing I encourage people to do is ask themselves the question, you know, which way am I looking, and then just yet yeah, let your surroundings answer that. If it's a sunny day and you, you've got any practice using the sun, you can answer it in in, in half a second and, and pretty accurately. But on a on a cloudy day in the middle of a middle of woodland, it takes it takes a little bit of practice to to nail it there. But it is possible, uh, not always to within one degree, but but it, you you can get a good sense of direction in any outdoors environment using um, some some sort of related, quite standard techniques. You know, the sun and the wind play a huge part in this, but I think of the sun and the wind leaving footprints and, and the it, it's almost sun and wind tracking. Um, so noticing that there are more flowers on, on one side of, a, a, of a, a bank or a rock or anything like that. It's the sort of thing that um, the vast majority of people would would ignore or, or not take anything from. But to a natural navigator, it's it's you know, it's starting to not just whisper, but scream direction. So, so how, how did you start noticing this stuff? How did you get into it? Well, I was, um, uh, I, I didn't sort of really come across natural navigation until, uh, some point in my twenties. I'm not, not sure exactly. It crept up on me a little bit, but, uh, I was a restless kid and I, I got really into journeys and I, I made a decision to pursue navigation once I realized that the thing I, I'd enjoyed a little bit of, um, flying small planes, a lot of trekking, um, you know, mountain treks and, and sailing small boats. And I was trying to think, well, what is it that's drawing me to do? And, and it's actually the shaping of journeys that, that really excited me. So uh, a lot of people get excited by kit. And I think a lot of people who listen to your podcast, you know, maybe kit people. Um, and and it's, it's like different. It's tribes within tribes. So there are tribes within the, the sailing world. You know, people on sailing boats are different to people on power boats. They're not better or worse. And it's the same in all outdoor environments. So I, I quite often I, I can notice kit people. You, you can see them. You know, they're the people who who park their car or their pickup or something, and and then they just get really excited pulling out all the bits and they take everything out of the rucksack and then put everything back in it and stuff like that. And they'll do that for two hours. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I know, I know that is not me either. Uh, no. But we have a lot of listeners that are, so I often forget to ask those types of questions because uh, I forget not everyone's like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i i'm i'm uh, obviously not a kit person so i would find when i was walking flying sailing on these little journeys that that people getting really animated talking you know spending an hour talking about you know the best type of rope to do certain, a certain thing on a boat and i was like thinking actually the boat itself i don't find that interesting it, it's and i was trying to work out what is it that's interesting to me and this is this is this sounds a little bit kind of weird and zen but i i sometimes say my ideal sailing wouldn't involve a boat um, because it's the it's the it's the understanding what the elements are doing and shaping a journey through that understanding that really excites me, and and you know hiking walking we we can do that that is um, I mean we might want to put some boots on but but there's not you know it's 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 not that kit focused and so it's it's a very it's sort of minimalist in terms of the kit you need but but sort of maximalist in terms of understanding what's going on around you because if you've got if you've got the latest best kit. You can get away without much knowledge because you can stare at a smartphone and get yourself, you know, from A to B, um, you know, with hundreds of dollars worth of kit in each hand. But uh, with natural navigation, you have to come in a completely different way. Um, you, you you have nothing in your hands, um, quite often not a huge amount in the pack, and your your chances of making B uh, might be determined by noticing a breeze on your left cheek. Man, I love this. I love this because I, I definitely fall into that category when it comes to a journey um, that is so funny, man. I, I honestly don't meet a whole lot of people that aren't kit focused. So this is, this is exciting. So, so you, you realized that what really fired you up or, or got you excited about your journeys was the navigation, um, in, in basically creating an adventure, trying to get from point A to point B. Um, did you start basically trying to do that naturally to get somewhere as the journey rather than you know, using everything you had at your power to, to get there, you would just say, I'm going to try to get here only based on natural direction. No, I, um, I, I went a sort of, um, I was a conventional navigator. I, 
I taught myself where I could, which was the walking part. I'm largely self-taught, a little bit of help here and there along the way. Um, uh, but flying and sailing, I did all the formal qualifications, um, you know, to, to reasonably high standards, sort of ocean yacht master, we call it in the UK. I don't know if it's the same in the States there, but uh, and multi-engine instrument rated pilot, et cetera, et cetera. But that, I was only doing that because I, I sort of legally had to do that. If there was a way of doing it without spending you know money on exams and, and training and stuff then i'd probably have tried to do it but i, I, was, I would have endangered everyone in the process but um but so then i pushed the journeys and the scale got bigger and bigger and bigger and i was taking on some quite quite sort of challenging things but the there was a kind of philosophical earthquake is is the only way i can describe it at the moment where i realized that the journeys were getting bigger you know, they, they were really quite sort of um, adventurous things, and yet they weren't getting any more exciting. And in a weird way, they were becoming less fun because, you know, the danger had gone up, so that gives you a bit of adrenaline. But then the, the amount of planning, you know, I mean, I, I at one point I put a stack of all the paperwork I'd needed to do, to do certain expeditions, and, you know, it was, it was getting sort of waist high. Um, and that's just not that's just not me at all. And yeah. and so I came across this idea uh, and I don't remember exactly how it all started, but it was it was this idea that you can find your way without using all this kit that I'd, I'd spent years and, and dedicated myself to learning how to use. Um, and, and I just tried it. And it, it was there was just no turning back. I mean, if you just try um, to cover even one mile um, outdoors, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you've got a map, uh, uh, and you, you find a, find a car park or something like that, and there's another car park, you know, one mile away and, and you're not just going to follow the road, you're going to go cross country for one mile. Um, you know, I can't say to people go and do that because we have to be careful in this age, but, but, you know, if, you know, that's what I did, I just crossed a little bit of English countryside, just using the, the trees, um, the, the sun and, and flowers and things like that. And, and, you know, it was, it was like a, it was like a bomb going off in my head. I was like, oh my God, this is the most exciting thing I've done since I was a child. It really was like, it was like sort of, um, you know, Christmas Eve as a child. It was, it was great fun. So, yeah, like I said at the beginning of the episode, I used to carry cans of food into the backcountry. And, uh, I know there's a lot lighter things to do, but, uh, there's just a lot of options that aren't good for you or either too heavy. Um, and that's why I really do uh, use Peak Refuel now. Um, they're a new backpacking food company. And I say backpacking food. Really, it's just uh, freeze-dried food that you can use for anything. I've actually eaten it for dinner before with my family uh, because it's real food. It's not. It does not taste like backpacking food or hunting food or something that you're only going to eat in the backcountry. It's, it's delicious high uh, in protein, uh, nutritious. It is going to refuel you. It is filling huge portions. And I really encourage you all to give it a shot. At least try it out. Uh, And that is peakrefuel.com. And if you want to get 20% off an order, uh, use the code ASP20. And that's capital ASP and then two zero. Now back to the episode. That reminds me, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing like your first adventure, your first journey. And, uh, I feel like we spend a lot of our lives. I mean, personally, I don't know if you fall in this category, trying to kind of re- recapture that, that amazement that of that first trip, because everything was new. You didn't know how to use anything. It was all just, just a new world. And, uh, you're just a lot more prepared in the future. And even when you push the, 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 boundaries it's still hard to recapture that first bit of magic um and so this has done that for you do you remember what you first noticed that said i can find my way using that was it one example or was it all started growing up together was it like a tree or a, or a puddle or something like that um well, I, I still get a little bit of that type of joy every day when I notice a new thing. I mean, it was only yesterday, I think it was, I put it, I put it on Instagram. Um, I just noticed some, all the clues are part of the same family. So they're quite often related to other ones. So, you know, you and your listeners will have come across the idea that moss grows on the north side of trees. And that, funnily enough, is, is, it's, it's, there's some truth in it, but it's, uh, I've, I've had to write a blog about it because it's one of the most complex techniques to use. Weirdly, it's, it's the best known and, and one of the least reliable unless you're very skilled. But 
I was walking through the woods near home um, yesterday or the day before, and I noticed that the, the the overnight rain had been brought in by a westerly wind and had just painted, you know, the west side of all the trees wet. Uh, and I could have walked easily for sort of five miles just on that clue. And that's what that clue is related to the moss. It's related to the lichens. It's related to, you know, a hundred other clues. But that exact one I had never used as my primary means of navigation. So I just had a bit of fun with it. And it brought that uh, that childlike joy we're, we're referring to back again. In terms of the first time it happened, um, I mean, there was that that very first sort of strolling across the, the countryside. But actually, there was a, a quite important moment for me, which happened at some point in my 20s, which um, I talk about a lot because I think it's in terms of the philosophy of this 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 art, it is, imp- it is important because um if you show somebody how to find the north star which some people learn how to do when they're eight years old and some people when they're 98 years old and an awful lot of people never learn at all but if you just show somebody how to use the plow as we call it here or the big dipper as i think think you refer to it there and you you find the north star and it's really not that complex and and most outdoors people most people listening to your podcast are probably familiar with it but 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 the interesting thing happens you 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 know the theory that okay so the north star is north and then what a lot of people do, and I certainly did um, uh, in my 20s or possibly a tiny bit before, is, is you, you get out a compass or, or these days a smartphone and you say, let me check. And what you're really saying to yourself is, let me check the North Star works. But if you, if you then do that enough times, you get there comes a moment quite quickly where you realize that actually the North Star is the reliable indicator. The thing in your hand works most of the time if you're lucky. And then, then there's this sort of penny drop moment where you go, well, wait a minute, if these two things disagree, it's the star that's working and the compass or the smartphone that's knackered. And at that moment, you realize that actually nature is more faithful. <laughs> you know, it is more true. And everything that we've invented over the past few thousand years, you know, does something between a, a rubbish and a good job most of the time. Uh, but, you know, nature is true. It, it, it is the nature that is direction. And that that is quite a sort of hard thing to, to get in a in a sort of loose sense in terms of conversation. But if you go out there and do the North Star exercise or look at shadows in the middle of the day, you know, you quite quickly get to this point, you go like, well, that that is direction. That is true direction. If, if anything, you know, whether it's, you know, electronic and paper form, if anything disagrees with that, then then we've made a mistake in our tool. It's not nature that, that's wrong. I, I love that. It, it's nature that's true, not this invention in your hand. You know, that's uh that's important and it is hard in this day and age, even for experienced outdoorsmen. I, I if my navigation is, is telling me one thing and I'm not I'm gonna trust it, most likely, even even if uh, even if it's wrong, um just because I've been kind of relying on it for so long. Um so it's good to have these skills kind of in your back pocket if needed, or to to totally build a journey from them. Um, so for you, you've obviously got just a plethora of, of tools and skills kind of in your tool belt to use in pretty much any situation. Um, how do you add a tool to that tool belt? How do you test a new idea like you noticed with the, uh, the west side of the trees getting wet? How do you test that until it's uh, proven enough for you to basically add that in your skill set? Um, it's, it's a good question. And I, um, I have a, a typical way of developing a new technique, which is, which is observation. And over the years, I've learned that I'm, I'm looking for, um, asymmetries, anomalies, things that are, are just sta- standing out for some reason. And then the question why, um, so to give you an example, um, Ivy has two stages of life. Now, I'd, I'd been trying to use Ivy to navigate for many years, and it had been frustrating me because every time I thought, oh, okay, I can see, all right, so it's, it's, it's growing towards the light, and then the next minute I was growing away from the light. My next stage then is to, like, like so many people in all areas of research and learning, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I'll, you know, instead of me being you know, arrogant and thinking I know everything about Ivy, I just quickly concede, and I go, there's probably quite a few people out there who know more about Ivy. So, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for other quite often in um, science journals, you know, ecology journals, things like that. I'll take the thing that I've noticed and see if anybody has noticed it more often than not in a completely different context. So I'll be standing, you know, out in the edge of the woods going, oh, I think I've learned how to find ivy, how to use ivy to find my way. 
uh, and 48 hours later, I'm like sort of punching the air because there's some um, uh, biological study that's been done into phototropism, the way plants grow towards or away from light. And I put those two things together and go, yes, my observations, you know, and that takes me on another step. Quite often I do it just by just by using nature and occasionally it's just by something I stumble across by reading. But normally it's that fusion of my observation, trying it out over a period of, you know, sometimes a couple of days, sometimes a couple of years. I mean, there's one moon, moon method I've been trying to nail for nine years now and still haven't. Um, uh, uh, but, but usually it's, it's you know, it, I guess that's what we've been doing as human beings, you know, since since dot. We go out there, we make a small discovery, we come back. And uh, ten thousand years ago, we sat around the fire and went, "Has anybody else noticed that?" And three people go, "Yeah, you fool. We've been we've been noticing that for for years." Oh yeah, great. So it works. That's kind of what I'm doing. You know, instead of the campfire, I'm I'm you know in the age of the internet, I can look in all sorts of different places. And um, so quite often the science is there. It's just nobody's chosen to use it for navigation for several thousand years. So quite often I'm just you know, blowing the dust off something that, that would have been you know, old, you know, old news many years. Wow. That's actually a really cool way to put it, blowing the dust off of it. Uh, are, are there skills that you've, uh, maybe, maybe a theory that you followed? Like, I think this is telling me something, follow it down the, you know, just a little bit and research it. And then it, it proves to be wrong or, or maybe, uh, unreliable. Yes. I, th- I think the, there is, um, I mean, my understanding of the wind's behavior grows each each year. And that's that's one of the things I love about nature is that you can get to a practical, useful, fun level really quickly, like within a day. But to you, you can't ever complete it, if you see what I mean. So, yes, it's a lifelong pursuit. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think. One of the things I encourage people with with learning anything to do with nature is not to be daunted because I was put off it in the early days. I think when any of us are too, if we're either in school or or not that long out of college or something, the idea of having to learn names, things like this, it's a bit like, oh, God, I think I've done that stage of my life. So my whole approach uh, and the way I you know write and teach about the subject is is names aren't important. So noticing pattern, just noticing things is, is, is you know, that's about 80 percent of it noticing things then noticing patterns um and noticing trends so an awful lot of people can go through their life without noticing that the prevailing wind will bend trees plants grasses over one way and once you notice that you know you, you'd be really really hard pushed to spend 10 minutes outside without seeing a compass of some sort and yet most people go their whole lives without noticing that so that's that's the kind of quick in but to actually master using the wind i think would take about 200 lifetimes because you know, I'm I'm still with each book. I'm pushing my you know my my skills and and my sharing of it out there in terms of you know how. I mean, it was only about four or five years ago that I learned that wind is 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 slowed more by partial um, cover than full cover. So I think most people imagine that a brick wall would stop the wind more than than a bunch of trees. But part experience followed by a bit of research taught me that actually. The wind is slowed more by by a bush than by a brick wall. Just, I mean, that in itself doesn't sound terribly practical or useful or even interesting necessarily. But it's just it's just part of that you know very very long journey to get to know this character that we call the wind. So it's, so it sounds like the wind's been one of your uh, most challenging um, skills to learn. Yeah, and it it, it um, as I, I I think I said it sort of leaves footprints everywhere. So once you get to know it it's um it's announcing itself i mean if we look up uh, where i am at the moment i can see some um some high cumulus clouds sort of moving um and again you know probably a, a small child could tell you that there's a relationship between the direction the clouds are moving and the the direction of the wind you feel but it's actually reasonably advanced natural navigation to know what that relationship is it actually requires um, you know, reasonably deep understanding of, of meteorology. But I, I generally, I try and avoid using words ending ology because it puts more people off. But, but the, the truth is you can, you can learn all this stuff by observation, but the wind that moves the clouds touches the ground, gets slowed and in, in meteorology terms, backs, turns, turns anti-clockwise. So, you know, just those words sound, you know, like, oh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's taking the beauty out of it, isn't it? But, you know, it, it is part of that, you know, I, I teach people you've got to 
use the clouds as, as one of your compasses and use the wind you feel as another compass uh, and you can you can you can keep them totally separate but if you want to try and understand the relationship then we're getting into more sort of intermediate um perhaps even advanced levels i mean i love this stuff and i and i spend as much time as i can outside and uh usually on a trail that's pretty well marked but not not all the time I, i've needed some some orientation and navigation skills before but uh f- for most people um, I don't know what the stats are in the UK, but in the US, something like 60 to 65% of the population live in an urban area, which only makes up like 3% of the land mass, uh, the land area of the US. Um, ha- have you developed skills to help like someone navigate an urban setting? Yes, and, and they're based on my my broad philosophy, which is absolutely everything is a clue. So... Um, TV satellite dishes have trends everywhere in the world, and it only takes a couple of minutes. You, you just look up and you notice most TV satellite dishes are pointing one way. Wow. Yeah, it'll be broadly towards the equator, but then there's a cultural aspect to it. So if you walk across a big city, you're, you're likely to move uh, through, through different, you know, cosmopolitan ethnic differences, stuff like that. You know, if you if you walk into the Chinatown, you'll find that people have a di- an interest in different channels, obviously, and therefore a different satellite. So you notice that this clue changes as you, as you cross into Chinatown or or, or any other um, area for that matter. Um, but there is, you know, as I say, absolutely everything is a clue. So the, there's still nature. The way um, you know mosses, algae, lichens grow in towns is still is still very useful. The, the the tip there is look above ground level because at ground level, everything's commercial in a town. So people are paying people to clean and wash and scrub and everything because they want to sell something through that, that, that ground level thing. But if you, if you, if you look up 20 feet, you find quite often a, a surface that hasn't been touched for, for a couple of years and you get a bit more nature there. But, but the, the animal that's easiest to find in towns is obviously the human being. And we are, we are all individuals, um, as I think he, he says in Life of Brian, isn't it? But, but, the, but the, 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 we, we also behave like a herd. So in simple terms, people go you know, out of stations and transport hubs in the morning and into them late in the day. So if you're completely lost in a town or a city, you just watch, watch what the herd are doing. You go against it in the morning or with it in, in the late afternoon and you'll, you'll find a station or a hub. Do you, do you find that more challenging personally, the urban setting? It's it's I I find it just as interesting and it's challenging um, because it's not my my sort of natural. I mean I've I've spent um, a few years of my life living in in London, um, but I'm not a natural city person, and so I find it forces my thinking into a different area, which is which is good for a bit. But you know it, it becomes more about um, sort of sociology in a way. You're, so to give you to give you an example, if you're completely lost in a in a city that's new to you. And you've decided you're going to ask somebody for help. All you've got to do is, is find a, a place where people are crossing the road, you know, not not following a, a regulated sort of traffic light type thing, but where people are making their own decision when to cross. And if you if you go go towards the people who are, who are taking the least time before stepping off the um, off the sidewalk, then you'll you'll have a local. So regardless of what, you know, we can look at what people are wearing and try and guess, is that a tourist? Is, you know, and sometimes that works and that's all part of this game. But actually, research has shown that the, the people who pause at the edge of the sidewalk don't know um, the town as well as the people. I mean, it's, it's all, all of this stuff is logical, but it's, it's the noticing. That's the, that's the real challenge. So all of you know that uh, I deal with some chronic pain, some chronic inflammation in my knees. And it's been an issue with my adventure sports career. Uh, But we just had Caleb Simpson on the show to talk about his company, Hemp Daddies. And I'm actually going to give their products a shot and see how they do. I'm going to be using their CBD oil and transdermal cream. I've been trying it out about a week now, and I've actually noticed I sleep better. Um, My stress and anxiety have even lowered a little bit, as well as my knees do feel a lot better. Their products are third-party lab tested. They're made from USDA organic hemp, and they're grown on a family farm right here in Colorado. If you'd like to give it a shot yourself, go to their website, hempdaddies.com, and use the code ADVENTURE to get 10% off your first order and free shipping. And I will keep you in the loop about how it does for me. So buying ski gear can be a pretty daunting process especially when it's online. But Powder 7 made that process incredibly easy. 
They live by their mantra, which is skiing for all, all for skiing, by being completely dedicated just to skiing and encouraging anyone and everyone to participate all year long. It really doesn't matter if you're looking for your first pair of skis or looking to round out your quiver. Uh, They have literally thousands of skis in stock, uh, new and used, so you can get a really good deal, a team of ski experts to help you find the perfect ski for you, and they stock every brand you can imagine. And not only skis, but they have everything else you need, whether it's a helmet or goggles, apparel, boots, bindings, poles, literally everything. The only thing they really don't get you is a lift ticket. It's crazy. So you can visit them online at powder7.com or stop by their store there in Golden, Colorado. But make sure you give them a shot before trying anywhere else for your ski equipment. So yeah, it, it seems very uh, common sense based, intuitive, even, but uh, really just taking the time to notice it. Yeah, and if like like most people, there, there's there are a few things more excruciating than you you finally decide to ask somebody, and and then you get the five minute answer, which is a a rambling version of I really don't know, but you could try this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, I, I do a lot of bike trips. And, uh, I would always ask locals, uh, direction, like, wh- where do I go? How do I do this? And they were the most unreliable folks to ask only because they felt this sort of pride in where they lived. And so if they didn't know the answer, because they don't look at it the same way that a cyclist would, uh, they would just make something up <laughs> and it would often yes. lead me in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. I, uh, I, I hadn't thought of that, but it, it, it makes good sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. If, if you look on bike touring or bike packing blogs, uh, lots of people have experienced that because, uh, you know, you notice every little change in elevation or, or, or every little curve in the road when you're on a bike, but ne- not necessarily on a car, especially when you've lived there your whole life. It's, it's really kind of counterintuitive phenomenon that happens everywhere. Yeah, I- I love I love the psychology of this sort of stuff, and it's it's just it's reminded me of the slightly random example, which um, which uh, I I call the the, the lighthouse example because I was first taught it uh, many years ago when I was I was doing my professional sail training, um, which is, uh, it's a skipper's tip basically. If you're if you're a skipper of a boat and the safety relies on finding a certain lighthouse at night, now the way you do it is you you look at the chart. And the way lighthouses identify themselves is by the number of flashes and the timing. So, for example, it could be three flashes every 10 seconds. Now, it's a very simple thing. But if you if you if you're the skipper and you come up from the chart table and you just you shout to the person on the helm saying, have you have you seen a lighthouse? They go, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. If you say to them, have you does it flash three times every 10 seconds? They'll go, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Whereas if you say, say what what are its characteristics? How, How often is it flashing and when? They will then give you an honest answer. Now, not many people are going to be in that exact situation, but the, the philosophy and the psychology applies in all situations. You know, if you if you hold up a map to somebody and say, you know, that path goes that way, doesn't it? You'll get a yes. You know, people don't like to upset people. Yeah, you get a yes. If you say, you know, which way does it go? You get an entirely different, you know, conversation. That's hilarious. So, so if you are trying to extract clues um, doing what you're doing, natural navigation from a local or, or from a person, uh, you have to be very careful about how you ask the question to con- to not have you know a confirmation bias or, or just lead you down the wrong path. Yeah, yeah, and you beat me to it. Confirmation bias is is one of the biggest pitfalls in natural navigation because again, I, I love the psychology. There's a there's a there's a stage in aviation called um, I think it's nicknamed the killing zone. Um, and it's it's not as you might imagine when people are really inexperienced. It's when people I think it's sort of between roughly one and two hundred hours of flying experience because you when you've just got your license at about fifty something hours, you're super careful. Just like when you've got your driving license, you're like, okay, I know I am a menace. I know everybody is in danger <laughs> around me. I'm going to be just so on my game. You then get exhausted from that approach and at a certain stage and everything. You, you you take your eye off the ball sometimes literally and and it's the same in the same in natural navigation you you start thinking this has got to be impossible i mean there's a reason why compasses and gps and all these other things were invented surely this is impossible and then you find yourself succeeding and at that point you know you start i mean my my kids my boys are um uh, 15 and 12 almost and uh and, th- and they're they're at this stage now where i i um i took them out at the the end of the last um holidays and i said right Okay, let, let's get some air. You know, I'm dropping you at this car park. There's a, there's a car park a couple of kilometers from, you know, um, north 
of here, I think it was. Off we go. And they, they very, very confidently get it right and they very, very confidently get it wrong. And I've, I've been on that that journey. And they, they're seeing the clues. They're identifying it right. They're using the right technique. But then there then comes a point where you go, okay, well, I sort of feel like I should be going this way and the clues backing me up instead of what you have to do, which is say, honestly, what is this clue telling me? Even if it disagrees with what my gut is telling me. Uh, and there are parallels with aviation there as well. You, one of the, the key things with aviation, with flying in cloud, is you have to trust the instruments because your inner ear will, will tell your brain that you're rolling to the left or you're going into a dive, uh, and your instinct will be to, to fight that with the controls. But the instruments are saying you're, you're flying level, don't do anything. It's the same outdoors with natural navigation. You, you get a feeling, you know, which can be prompted by all sorts of different things um, and is slightly different in all of us, that, that you want to go a certain way. And at that point... It's very easy for the nature to say, yeah, you're right. You keep going that way. But actually, you have to do it the other way around. You have to say, I, I don't have a feeling. I, I, wanna, I, want, I want to look at the nature objectively. You know, what, what is this lichen telling me? You know, what, what is the fact that these three, you know, uh, flowers are pointing the same way? What is that actually saying? And, and quite often that will be a, you know, 20, 30 degree difference, which, which over a couple of miles is, is quite a lot. You know, I, I, I'm sure you get asked this a lot. Um, I know you do. And I can already hear listeners grumbling. Why in the world would anyone need this this skill set? Oh, it's no, it's it's a question I don't, I don't I don't tire of because it's um it's a good one. And the the answer is it, it, the practical need is is close to nil. There's there's a more than ninety nine percent chance that none of us will need this um, in a survival sense. So I don't even approach it from that. I, I approach it because because this is very much why I've pursued the the art of natural navigation is that it, it, it enriches our journeys. We learn a lot, which is which is satisfying for lots of people, but we experience a huge amount, which is which is, you know, why why choose to be outdoors these days unless it's about the experience. You know, we can pretty as you were saying in your statistics about um, you know, town living, you know, we can get through most of our day with, with only a few seconds of, of outdoors. So most of the time we're choosing to be outdoors because of the experience of natural navigation. I honestly believe, you know, doubles, trebles, quadruples the intensity of that experience. One mile using natural navigation, um, is, is genuinely, you know, the same as a, as a full day, um, you know, being led. I mean, it, to give you an urban example of it, I think everybody's had that experience where you're having to drive somewhere in a town you haven't been before. And because you're having to drive, you whether you do it through digital means or other means or whatever, you 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 build a relationship with that bit of the town. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna have to cross the river, I'm gonna have to okay. So you start a very basic relationship with the town. If you're a passenger in the same car, and this has happened to me loads, I'm I'm no different from anybody else. You know, it's it's quite normal for my wife to drive me somewhere in a town and then She'll drink a couple of glasses of wine and say, right, they're the keys. You're, you're, and I'll go, I, I really have no idea. I really don't know where we are you know, <laughs> because we, I've switched off. Um, and it, it's, it is, it's the same outdoors. We, we are all switching off. And natural navigation is, is a fun way of, of just saying that, that ain't going to wash. You are going to have to pay attention. You are going to have to understand what's going on around you. Through that comes a relationship. And it's, it's like everything outdoors. There's a bit of effort at the beginning. Uh, and then a huge amount of payback. Wow. So, so, so it sounds like it draws this new level of, of excitement and new level really of adventure in uh, everyday life. Yes. Uh, and I, uh, coming back to something I was talking about earlier, the tribes, I, I try not to um, pontificate. I'm trying not trying to say one thing is ever better than another um, because, you know, e each to their own. And I think there are people out there I mean, I, I come across people who are really into orienteering who have absolutely no interest in natural navigation. And initially it confused me. I was like, oh, surely, you know, being able to sense direction using, you know, the, you know, uh, 19 different ways to turn a tree into a compass. Surely that's got to be of some interest to you. Um, but I was wrong. You know, they, they, they basically wanted to run outdoors and use their mind a tiny bit. Other people want to use their mind a lot and their body a lot. Some people... Yeah, a lot of people into natural navigation don't don't do journeys of more than a couple of hundred meters, a couple of hundred yards. They, they you know, they, it's about making a map. It's about understanding that the the fact that bird um, on the tree is now facing a different direction 
uh, tallies with my sensing the wind has changed, which which tallies with the fact that I can now see a ring around the sun altogether, which means it's going to rain in four hours. You know, it's all part of this really rich picture. And you don't actually have to go on an expedition of any sort to do that. So for me, it's all personal choice. You know, you want to go you want to go half a mile or you want to go, um, you know, a thousand miles. Uh, one's not better or, or, or worse than the other. It's, it's a personal choice. But if you want a deeper experience, um, if, you, if you're interested, I sometimes call this subject bushcraft for the mind. Um, you know, if, 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 if that appeals to you, then natural navigation is, is um, it, it's a fun world. So, so how can people uh, get in touch with you and how can they learn more about natural navigation? Uh, thanks for asking. Yeah, I've got a, a website which I've been building um, over more than a decade now called naturalnavigator.com. And you can explore that. Um, I, I've deliberately set it up so that you can kind of explore it. You can go in looking at star examples, looking at animal examples, looking at weather examples. Um, there are details of all my books on there. Um, I do give talks and I run courses. In truth, I'm very lucky that, that you know, there are people all around the world who have an interest in this. And uh, I can't always get to, to the area somebody's in. But I, I have a newsletter where I send out information uh, about when I am giving talks and things like that. And it's easy to subscribe through the website. Um, but it's, yeah, I'd say have a little explore of the website. If this sounds like your sort of thing, then, then I, I, I've written half a dozen books on the subject. Uh, and they all have a slightly different approach and niche um, again, appealing to different aspects of the subject and, and in turn to the different tribes out there. So hopefully there'll be one for you. Man, I, well, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about this because, uh, I, I admittedly don't know a lot about natural navigation yet. I claim to be an outdoor enthusiast. So these types of things will really just draw out interesting perspectives, no matter if it's a walk around the block with my dogs, or if it's a hike up in the mountains. Uh, this could definitely add a lot of uh, excitement just to the little little interactions with the outdoors every day. Great. Yeah, go for it. And uh, that question I mentioned before, which way am I looking? You know, if you just ask yourself that question, just stare into the distance, even if the distance is only a, a few yards from you, and, um, and, and just ask yourself, which way am I looking? And th there's a very good chance there are several dozen clues to the answer to that question uh you know within within your senses uh, that's awesome so yeah all right every listener you go outside today if you you know you might be very familiar with your area but try to spin around a couple times then uh, open your eyes and say <laughs> which direction am i looking that'll be a good test <laughs> go for it all right well tristan yeah thank you so much for being on the show man thanks a lot for having me mason happy yes, navigating sir. all right you as well take care all right bye bye Hey, thank you so much for listening. If you know somebody that would make a good guest on the show, or if you have a pretty cool story about the outdoors or adventure sports that you want to tell us, please call us and leave a voicemail at 812-MAIL-POD. That is 812-624-5763. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. Uh, again, it is always helpful to leave us a review on iTunes. And if you'd like to be a supporter of the show, you can give five bucks a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast and links for all that stuff is also in the show notes. So thanks again for listening and y'all get out there and do something so you can be on the show one day. All right, later. Also, don't forget if you want to save 20% off the best backpacking food on planet earth, go to peakrefuel.com and at checkout, use the code ASP 20. So now in their 12th season, Powder 7 is setting the bar for ski retailers everywhere with their personalized service, wide selection of skis, and gear. Visit them online at powder7.com or stop by their store in Golden, Colorado. Also, don't forget, if you're dealing with inflammation, pain, stress, anxiety, lack of sleep, do some research and check out hempdaddies.com for CBD oil and transdermal cream. And use the code ADVENTURE at checkout to save 10%.